Welcome to the fifth and last session uh, on territory, urbanism beyond technofix. Um, so we had uh, Theo Deutinger, uh, Iris van der Thun and Anna Verhoff, uh, Ola Soderstrom, and last week uh, Ines Weizmann. Um, and we're very happy to uh, introduce for our last um, session uh, Pascal Müller. He's the director of ESRI uh, uh, Research and Development Center in Zurich. Um, where new technologies for urban planning and 3D mapping are being developed. He's the original author of City Engine, a software used in film production, uh, such as Blade Runner 2049 or Zootopia and Urban Design uh, by HOK, SOM, Foster and Partners, for instance. In 2008, Pascal co-founded the startup company Procedural, which um, was then uh, later uh, bought, uh, sold to Esri. Uh, with his PhD at ETH, he was pioneering uh, new methods for procedural modeling of cities and buildings, which are now part of City Engine, uh, ArcGIS Urban, ArcGIS Pro. Uh, Pascal has published extensively and has held numerous uh, talks at <coughs> conferences, universities, and companies all over the world. And his body of artistic work includes short movies, uh, music videos, and over 50 live visual performances and interactive museum installation, including Ars Electronica. And uh, we're very happy that uh, he accepted our invitation and uh, he will talk about automated urban design. And we're very much looking forward um, to uh, have him in conversation after his talk with uh, Fabio Gramazio, which uh, holds a professorship here at um, ETH Zurich. Uh, Fabio is an architect with multidisciplinary interests ranging from computational design and robotic fabrication to material innovation. In 2000, he founded the architectural practice uh, Gramazio and Color with Matthias Koller, um, where numerous award-winning designs were uh, realized. The current, uh, most current projects include the design of the EMPA Nest research platform, which is a future living and working laboratory for sustainable building construction. And uh, he also opened with um, uh, Professor uh, Collar the uh, first architectural robotic laboratory at ETH and um, has been formative in the field of digital architecture, setting procedures, precedents, and de facto creating a new research field, merging advanced architectural design and additive fabrication processes through the customized use of industrial robots. And his recent uh, research is um, published in the book, uh, which you have the cover here, which is called The Robotic Touch, How Robots Change Architecture. And uh, so I will stop sharing my screen. We are very much uh, looking forward to the conversation afterwards, but um, of course, first, um, uh, very excited to hear Pascal's presentation, um, which, uh, I will then leave him the floor. After um, that talk, then uh, we will discuss with Fabio and uh, Professor Milisa Topalovic and myself. And um, whoever feels comfortable uh, can, of course, join the conversation or ask um, and type questions in the chat if the connection is not um, good enough or if you're not comfortable. So Pascal, thank you very much. Um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so, first, uh, thanks very much for the nice invitation. <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, I'm currently on Canary Islands, so uh, I hope the um, internet connection is uh, good enough. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, Are you trapped uh, there, so or is it by choice? Yes, yes, I'm one of the Swiss trapped uh, there, but uh, it could be worse. Actually, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, so yeah, I want to uh, talk mm -hmm. about um, yeah, computational urban design and basically yeah, talk a bit about where it goes. And um, yeah, and I think for me personally it was the, basically the main uh, thing where the whole, um, the whole thing started was um, Christopher Alexander's book, uh, A Pattern Language. Uh, from the 70s. So, yeah, that, that was also for me when I was doing, uh, basically, when, when I was a student, I uh, was very impressed by it. Uh, kind of like the first kind of guy who actually really tried to write down how things are connected 
uh, in a systematic way and uh, he actually yeah, developed kind of a hybrid text and uh, and really described how this describe a CD from really big scale down to sidewalk scale and uh, <clears throat> yeah and it's not just for architecture I think it's a very important book it's also for uh, software engineering actually a really important book so means yeah this guy I think was one of the most important guys in uh, computational design he basically yeah was one of the pioneers to kick it off however he um, said that multiple times in his career actually uh, said uh, yeah that design uh, is actually not a problem that can be solved with computers so so this was i think uh, he said this first time in the 60s and repeated it until the 80s um so now the question is a bit like in the last few decades quite a lot happened um, i mean like we have uh, social media, we have um, where we have really uh, huge amounts of data. We have um, machine learning, which is kind of uh, promises to solve everything. Um, urban computing, uh, geographic information systems, everything. So is it really still true what he's saying? Um, how much uh, do computers help us these days? in and how better are the designs actually getting or how better are the cities today so <clears throat> before i go in this and uh, basically yeah, discuss this question i guess i have to explain a bit more who i am and uh, why i dare to <laughs> trying to answer this um so as mentioned the uh, the whole we basically started 20 years ago with uh, the first version of CD Engine. Uh, that was my um, master thesis back then at ETH, um, where we uh, created a tool which yeah generates cities. Um, back then it was mainly for entertainment. Later um, in my PhD at ETH Zurich, I um, focused more on the building part. So kind of like also how I can how can I encode buildings. And uh, how can I, uh, yeah, um, uh, really put architectural styles into the computer and then actually really play with it? Um, here, what you see, it's all based on the shape grammar. Um, so it means, yeah, we really could also we could even morph. Uh, so what you see here is a, a morph between Semper Sternwarte and uh, Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier. Um, yeah, that was back then I was young and didn't actually thought why this <laughs> should be done. But uh, yeah, um, from an artistic point of view, it was impressive. Um, so <clears throat> we then founded 2008 uh, Procedural, where we sold CD Engine and as a product. And then 2011, as mentioned, got acquired by Esri. So now, since then, we are actually not just developing CD Engine, we are developing actually in the meantime three tools. So we are almost 60 people now. And uh, one is still CD Engine, then we are actually the biggest team works on the 3D part of ArcGIS Online. And then we have a new product called ArcGIS Urban. And uh, I want to quickly uh, show you um, what these tools do um so yeah cd engine you might have heard about it it's really a very unique tool to for the procedural but also actually the manual modeling of kind of city blocks so the diff the best kind of size is like uh two to ten city blocks that kind of size and you can have all the numbers you have your uh, density parameters um setbacks and everything and then um these days of course it's important um, to visualize you have good visualizations and uh, this is done by the unreal engine uh, so this is a game engine um, which is famous for its visual quality and what you see here is a city engine model of a pasadena master plan uh, in the unreal engine and uh, so but 
city engine also, so yeah, city engine gets mainly used by architects and urban planners, but uh, also it gets used for films, like uh, like we heard, Zootopia uh, uh, from Disney, which is pretty amazing, city done in city engine, and Blade Runner, one thing we're very proud of, um, or then also TV like Game of Thrones, um, yeah, all this kind of stuff. But again. Um, main our main focus is on urban planning and design, and uh, and but um, to actually really enable this, you also need um, more base technology. And what you see here is um, ArcGIS Online. So what you see here is in the browser. So it means you can do one click, and then you can see this um, as a one one URL, and and you can see this scene. Um, and you can also, this works also on the phone. So it's basically like Google Earth, but um, in the case of Esri, this is about your data and you can mesh it up with different data sets and uh, create applications around it. And uh, what you see here is basically the, um, the visualization um, of the real world. Um, so, so yeah, the, the reality capture. Um, however, um, this is only one part of the whole story. Um, what you also can do in ArcGIS Online is, of course, you can basically schematic visualize uh, data sets in any form. So here, for example, um, I think the, the darker the buildings, the more uh, pro the more uh, endangered for flooding they are. Um, or then you can stylize your buildings and create applications on, around it, put layers on top of it. Again, everything in the browser and uh, very, very accessible. Um, I think this is kind of the key is it's really, it's one click away. You send somebody an email or a WhatsApp with a URL and you're there. And then, um, also what's even possible is you can also do some kind of like crafty, um, sketchy um, visualizations, um, which are like hand-drawn um, and those all in 3D and you can fumble around in 3D, etc. So this is really kind of, it's, it's, it's a huge rendering engine and it's actually not just for cities, it's for the whole globe. And we in Zurich yeah, developed this technology for the browser. So now, if we now combine city engine and uh, the power of uh, ArcGIS Online 3D, um, we can create a new product, which we call ArcGIS Urban. And uh, with ArcGIS Urban, we actually really um, try to make a tool which enables to manage, communicate, and also plan um, cities, like for planning departments. So here you see, um, for example, all the all the buildings in the city which get um, yeah, which are uh, which have been approved or which are under review and uh, are in the pipeline. And then, of course, um, and this is I think the most complicated part is that we kind of try to figure out solutions to uh, the zoning. <laughs> so it means. Uh, there are zoning, there are land use plans, there are so many land use policies, and uh, we really try to make a tool uh, which is yeah, simple to use, where people can, um, planners can basically modify, edit, and create all these scenarios for um, planning. So, so means this is kind of like where we are, and like so means like yeah, so basically since 20 years we are working on this urban planning, urban design uh, topic. Uh, but always from a software engineering point of view. Of course, we are in contact with lots of architects, um, but nonetheless, um, yeah, we are software engineers. And uh, of course, we always try to understand the architects. <laughs> and I guess it's the other way around also. And uh, But yeah, for us, of course, architecture is something which is very uh, yeah, near to us. And uh, yeah, and I kind of want to show also very quickly, basically a bit what was for us um, the most kind of important things in the in the history of urban design, and which I think um, yeah really were the ground groundworks for 
tools like City Engine. So um, the whole thing started about 100 years ago with Le Corbusier. Um, that was for me a very inspiring book. Um, he described there in kind of with a algorithmic beauty um, how how really uh, how cities uh, should look like of course in a very utopian way and uh, he came with this uh, <laughs> tower in the park kind of idea and uh, this i think is the villa rogers uh this is the uh, city con the contemporary city and i mean from a geometric point of view it's very beautiful um and uh, when I saw that as a student, I was fascinated. And uh, and yeah, and uh, I basically, with the first uh, version of City Engine, what I did was uh, I played with the cruciform skyscraper of uh, Corbusier, or I uh, also or or we or with the master plan. But then, or but I was a student, and uh, I didn't. Uh, uh, think too much about things yet so it was a technology first kind of thing um, however I was not the only guy who was inspired by Le Corbusier um, there was also uh, yeah, for example uh, just one example a uh, street town in New York City um, which uh, has been deep inspired by Le Corbusier and from the top kind of looks geometrically pleasing um, and uh, however um from uh, in 3d uh, and in reality uh, yeah it turned out to be quite a disaster um this uh, story town i think it's very criminal rates have been high and all these kind of things um i think it got better a bit in the meantime but uh, yeah it's it's the tower in the park idea is was maybe not such a good one and this actually um quite in the neighborhood of here um there was uh, i guess every urban design talk has to mention <laughs> jane jacobs but she was like really in the neighborhood of this um of Stuart town east village and uh, she uh, yeah she was basically the first one who said hey guys uh, um maybe talk with people what they actually want and uh, and figure out um yeah explore and experience the place before you make design and she really influenced a lot how people thought about urban design and also these um kind of algorithmic approaches of uh Corbus, et etc were um yeah um were kind of proven wrong however at the same time um also what's more and more was emerging was uh, the the body of regular tourists so it means um yeah land use policies um, zoning laws more and more and more the books got bigger and bigger and uh, and yeah and i think also actually jane jacobs was also influencing of course what is what was written in there um for me again as a from a 3d geometric point of view what was interesting was always the the how actually the setbacks and the and this regulatory body already kind of defined the shape uh, or the design space for an architect inside um so what you see here is you ferries um where you where he applies all the different uh, yeah, rules in the city and what you can see on the very right is basically a building just uh, designed by the rules and um of course um this is more like the probably for this architecture but um it's an interesting uh yeah from a geometric point of view it's it's an interesting piece However, it's not just about this uh, zoning envelope hall. There are so many laws um, and so many um, yeah, um, procedures and things you need to know um, about parking, about uh, about overlays, about uh, um, yeah, what's in your neighborhood, um, 
yeah, it's it's pretty pretty complicated. And this was was really um, I think this is this is really is the problem. And um, and and because of this, um, it's it's really it's it's an immense complexity of of uh, law of, so of societal needs, and then of then are also the economic needs and really really high complexity. Kind of in the same time in the 60s, um, the whole design methods movement started, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, uh, um, Christopher Alexander was part of this, and uh, probably uh, one of the most famous ones. Herbert Simon uh, is also very famous for his problem-solving um, theory. Or uh, George Steiny uh, from MIT was for me kind of uh, very inspiring. So these guys basically discussed uh, on the one hand on a completely theoretical level and about design in in general how to uh, yeah um, how to solve the problems but um, then also specifically about architecture and uh, and to some degree about urban planning so I think based on these discussions um, yeah software design tools like CD engine um, emerged and um, however, of course, CD Engine wasn't the only one. Of course, CD Engine is a very computational design specific one, but there are so many approaches to um, what does design computation mean, um, and ex accordingly, there are many, many tools. Um, of course, from architecture, there's uh, mainly computer data design and uh, building information modeling um, tools, and then um, I think for cities, very important are the geographical information system, where ESRI uh, is, is uh, of course, uh, the market leader and uh, also uh, yeah, gives us a lot of uh, us, meaning the R&D center in Zurich, gives us a lot of inputs there. And then, of course, there are the 3D tools um, like SketchUp. And uh, so, yeah, uh, there are really, really a lot of tools. So, all these design tools which we're having, what does it mean for urban design today? I think in the meantime, everybody knows how to basically use the 3D tools to basically to create the perimeter block with some kind of a, a death of the segment and then some kind of tower in the north and then it's open to the south and then there are some also green promenade. Um, I think this kind of workflows are there and these tools are there. However, um, actually, we are still kind of having the same discussions as, uh, as 60 years ago uh, with Jane Jacobs. Uh, but instead of Jane, we got now Jan. <laughs> um, so it means, yeah, uh, Jan Gael, I think uh, uh, he's a pretty uh, great Danish architect. And uh, he has, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see, like he has this kind of uh, thing he calls per chip architecture, um, where he says that cities are really kind of planned from the very top. Um, he often uses Brasilia as an example, but also newer uh, modern cities. And uh, funnily, Brasilia actually, yeah, the master plan was a uh, bird. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, Brasilia, we know, uh, Kind of uh, Oscar Niemeyer kind of saved the day with the this glorious architecture. However, um, yeah, um, Jan Gale has a point um, when he talks about that the human scale that urban design should actually really happen more on the ground and not so much uh, from the top. Um, one of his examples is the the Ninth Avenue uh, where um yeah he basically went in uh saw saw these five lane roads um then hired a graphic engineer to figure out that this five lane road is actually not needed made a two lane two lane car road out of it added bike lanes and greenery and of course we have of 
course, we have now uh, a much, much better, um, it's a much more livable city now. It's much, much better. And um, so, yeah, um, Didi and Gail find the, the formula. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it looks like uh, three simple steps. Uh, so you have some traffic simulation software and then you um, design the new road. Um, seems very simple. And uh, from a design tool perspective, it is actually very simple. So here, this is an example of city engine. And this is really kind of in minutes, somebody is now here using um, city engine to to go and uh, and change these roads. Now he adds a median, and uh, in this case he actually creates two lanes and some parking there, um, but it adds more greenery. But you can also see there are actually other scenarios with bike lanes, here with bike lanes, or here with uh, public transport. So he creates very quickly kind of different scenarios. Um, and also, again, like in City Engine, you can use all the, you get the numbers out, um, all these numbers that road engineers uh, have. Um, so about like how much pavement and uh, drainage and all this kind of stuff. Um, but so it's very, very simple to do. And, and uh, of course, there's the car discussion, there's, there's the traffic discussion. But there seems to be a nice, would be nice if cities apply this more. However, mm -hmm. what you see here is uh, now the, the Rosengarten. So this is one of these urban canyons in Zurich. And they just recently had a vote and, uh, about this. And uh, they did um, kind of a few things right. So it's one of these examples where they actually really change a four lane road into a two lane road. And, redirected traffic. Um, however, I don't know for what reasons. Um, you can say it was too expensive or you can maybe say that the design was not so good or whatever, but uh, the public didn't want this. Um, so means urban design is not just about the design tools. It's really about uh, about also actually really communicating. Um, how can you communicate your design? Is it good enough? Um, how can you make your city more livable? Um, so why does the public prefer to have um, like an urban canyon? Um, of course, again, uh, there are many reasons, but, and I don't want to go into this, but I just want to say uh, basically that complexity is still a problem today. <laughs> so we are at the same kind of, um, we're still, we are still cannot handle the complexity of urban planning and urban design. And it's not just the tools. It's really also about everything around it. And this is why we, um, yeah, why I think we have to kind of go away from, um, the tools and think bigger. <laughs> So really think about like whole systems um, means we need to be able to, to on the one hand, we need to do urban design on a street scale, but then we also need to do urban design on a block scale. But sometimes there are urban planners doing it on the city-wide scale. So means um, the politics of a city. So for example, I don't know, uh, Hong Kong, they, Hong Kong gets, the order, the, the, the planner sits in his office, uh, in his planning department, and then he, the mayor calls him of Hong Kong and says, hey, in, uh, in 30 years, I, need, I have uh, 2 million people more, figure it out. Uh, this is basically how it is, seriously. Like, the politics gives, um, gives, gives talks about, like, how much dense, uh, the density requirements in, like, 20 years, and they have to create long-range plans where the planners have to create long range plans to figure it out. Um, and so all these all this systems, as all these problems kind of, yeah, how can we encode them? How can we build them, map them to, a, to, to such an urban planning system? And um, so what is the solution? Um, here now, 
this is basically Iron Man, and uh, he's playing with uh, some kind of holo holodeck, and uh, he has natural language, and he can go in and talk with the design, and he gets all the information and uh, understands everything, and uh, and everything gets visualized in a nice way. So, this is what we want to build. <laughs> and I think with we, with we, I don't mean us as Esri, I mean software engineers. <laughs> um, and uh, and I think, uh, yeah, and I want to talk a bit about this, like, of course, we have Esri also want to build that. Um, however, there are kind of multiple challenges to this. Um, and they are not just of technical form, unfortunately. So um, challenge number one, the data. So we all heard the term digital twin. And uh, that means, uh, yeah, first, before you to create such a holodeck, you need uh, the data of your city in 3D, which is already, which already poses a problem. Um, of course, uh, Google has this data because they fly over the city, but um, some cities don't have that. And this is now the reality capture of it, but it can also be just a schematic, uh, yeah, more kind of uh, untextured, blocky visualization, some kind of 3D model. Um, so getting this data is already kind of first challenge. And then also you need to maintain it and update it and etc. The second thing is the historical data. And this is actually cities are, are are collecting insane amounts of data. Um, however, um, it's very, very hard to process. Um, so here, this is an example of pedestrian industry, uh, injuries in San Francisco. So we are again at Young Gale and his human scale and the ground level. Um, but it's really, really um, difficult and uh, to actually really have an overview over all this data. Of course, the cities offer now these open data portals. And uh, so means it's transparent, it's open. However, um, yeah, if, if there is a, if there, a geographer is needed to actually uh, process the data first for like a, an hour with ArcGIS Pro to actually really kind of make a visualization out of it, or this is this is problematic. Um, so means yeah, this data needs to be accessible and understandable. Um, same goes for current data. Like, how do I actually visualize um, that? Uh, for example, here, how full is my city? <laughs> it means basically what you see here is like um, the um, potential of uh, housing and uh, how much. How much, uh, so yeah, how much housing volume we have and uh, what's still vacant and uh, per district. So this kind of visualizations in a way that people actually understand what's going on and that they can relate them to where they live, I think is, is, a, is a challenge. And then of course, now comes the whole discussion about big data. Um, here, I think the taxi trips of like the last 10 years in New York City. Um, and now um, you can use machine learning to segment and understand this data, um, which is fine and good. Um, however, um, we are also getting into the, in the censoring and this, um, yeah, I think theoretically nowadays with computer vision technology, um, they could basically follow a person through the whole city of London. Um, um, I, I don't know if this is true. I'm just saying theoretically, probably possible. Um, but um, we have all this censoring data. And then again, together with machine learning, etc., you can actually really um, understand a lot about your, about your city. And then even bigger, the social media data, like you can um, you can access the Twitter uh, or Twitter data or Foursquare data, 
and and figure out things there. And uh, this can be of of help for um, for uh, for urban planning to actually really understand. For example, do people like it uh, or not? Um, yeah, these kind of things can be figured out using social media. Um, and then, last but not least, you also have corporate data. There are some companies which probably know more about the cities than the city itself. Um, I think here this is uh, from Uber and Uber traffic data in, in Los Angeles. Um, but of course, a company like uh, Facebook or Apple, they of course have huge amounts of data. Um, and, uh, and I'm not saying uh, because of privacy or something, they probably aggregate this data properly. And uh, But they have very valuable uh, data for urban planning. Um, so yeah, um, there's really, really lots of data. And the whole discussion on data is, is, is a very, very difficult one. I, we at S3, we were always kind of we actually not a data host or ESRI. ESRI. The idea of ESRI is actually really empower organizations to have their own data. So, uh, and I think, uh, it's my personal opinion, I think uh, actually really this, the city, the data of a city should actually be maintained by the city and by my elected officials. So, um, so, but nonetheless, wherever the data comes from, wherever it's hosted, I think for urban planning and urban design, it's very, very important that uh, is the user experience. <laughs> so means, um, how can I explore the data? How do I understand the data? Um, how can I interact with the data? And, uh, and also, how is it visualized? Because it's not just about giving people access to the data. It's about how can you make honest interpretations of this data and communicate it uh, in an easy way. And uh, and I think this is this is super important for us as software engineers, but now I also include, and especially mean that they're important, is our, the UX UI designers. I think they're so important that this, that this kind of um, data sets are, are kind of, are, enable really people to understand and also communicate uh, decisions and uh, really lead to informed decision making. However, on the other hand, um, software engineers doing stuff which actually probably maybe other people should do sometimes leads to bad things. Um, so yeah, we really have to be careful that we don't fall into a technology first trap here. Um, privacy is our one, but also the political misuse of this data. Um, it's basically, however I tune my data, however I filter my data, I can probably make every statement. Um, and then there are ethical risks like, uh, do I only have the data of uh, rich people? <laughs> because they uh, use Uber and have uh, iPhones, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, so, so yeah, um, but of course, data helps urban planning to, and urban design and needs to be part of, uh, of an uh, of a urban planning system. <clears throat> Challenge two, complexity. Um, so, as mentioned, uh, this is probably the main problem that everything is so connected. And uh, here, um, one, this is just an example. Uh, one example are these general plans uh, of American cities. They are um, basically about like, they define how the city looks in the next 10 years. And they are huge, um, huge books basically, and uh, very, very important. Uh, very, very important for the uh, shape of the city, for the cityscape, but uh, very difficult to read and understand. So um, what's happening now is, for example, you can use machine learning. So, for example, here the zoning document of zoning text is 4,000 pages of the city of, of New York. 
you can use machine learning. So this is a startup, uh, Viva City, um, very cool guys. Um, they actually use machine learning uh, to really go in and uh, and and, and uh, yeah, translate this natural language, natural language of the zoning codes into something which is amenable for computer implementation. So actually they really come out with code and numbers and then you can go from the, you can, you can go, they link from the code to the actual texts in the, in the zoning resolution. And uh, this is a very nice example of machine learning and using kind of segmentation. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's all about, it's basically natural language processing, kind of. And so what you now can do is you can take these um, zoning rules, which they figured out there. Um, so for example, they figured out the setback is 10 meters when, when, it's, when it's mixed use, whatever. Um, and it's only five stories uh, allowed in this zone, this kind of stuff. And you can take these rules and take them into a design tool like you see here, Archie Servan. Um, uh, this is the plan designer of Archie Servan. So uh, we can put it in here and then, and now again, we are at basically goals, always goes down to UX and UI design. It's about now, how can I change easily? How we can create what if scenarios? How, what happens when I have to change the density now? And remember the Hong Kong example, like where they have to figure out like how they, yeah, put more density, uh, where, how, um, I mean, yeah, probably nobody wants to have higher density, but, um, yeah, uh, you, you need some kind of tools to uh, trying to figure it out. Uh, at least, or basically, the yeah, the best worst, the worst best uh, possibility. However, um, yeah, what we are now working on is really um, trying to the high complexity just of the zoning and the land use planning, and then the actual really economic development in the city. This kind of three levels. Uh, kind of trying to put that into into software with good user experience and UI design. Um, so then this is this is now just a prototype, but uh, of course what always comes up here is machine learning to solve the design problem. Um, and yes, um, you can use machine learning to explore the design space. And uh, probably machine learning makes it quicker to explore this design space and give you and propose you alternatives. So what you see here is, for example, a rule in CD Engine, um, which tries to optimize the number of plants on the Vulcan here um, by changing the architecture. Um, so, so these kind of things are are possible. Uh, with machine learning these days, but um, yeah, I'm. Uh, it, it actually surprising takes still quite some time, and it's not so easy to build this. Uh, this uh, to apply machine learning for design is actually pretty hard. It works well for language processing, and it works well for computer vision, but for design. Hmm. Of course, here we found actually a building which has lots of trees, uh, so that's good. However, machine learning, for me at least for now, it's really just a tool, um, and uh, it's pretty really good for understanding the complexity. Uh, but it can be expensive, uh, but it can be used actually really for optimizing some specific design cases. However, for general design process. I think it's not not usable. Again, for me, um, this is the wrong discussion about uh, machine learning and about technology. And if I now use deep learning or gradient descent, I know why. This is just about uh, yeah, optimizing your design. Um, 
I think uh, for me, the bigger challenge in the design tools and process is still that the user experiences and the user interfaces are, are not there where they could be. Um, so, and the last challenge of urban planning systems, and this is actually the most important one is, so now you created all this great design, you have all the data to, um, to actually really make it an informed design. However, there's uh, the outreach part, and uh, this is um, this is uh, there are no kind of digital tools for that. Of course, there are little helpers here and there, but and it's also um, it's also pretty good. Oh, like there are these town hall meetings, and this is also in Europe, not in it's not just in the US, um, where they actually discuss you new know, uh, master plans, and um, but of course. This stuff also gets more and more digitalized, and especially now with the whole situation we are in, um, I guess uh, yeah, it will be more and more digitalized, but it will not replace these kind of activities uh, which you have about uh, around the master plan. Or this can also be, I don't know, a bicycle, uh, bicycle tour around the master plan, or it can be, um, I don't know, a, a, party from 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 the developer or whatever this kind of stuff there are lots of activities how you communicate your design which are beyond computers however we as software engineers of course um try to improve the computer part um so um and there for example what you see here in urban which is urban is is uh, how you can comment on on an urban planning on a on a design and uh, and really on, on a project and you can explore it and then it also really depends on how much data you actually have and you can also have a more detailed 3d building there um yeah um however of course whenever you have commenting for example then you need moderation However, uh, there's again machine learning which can kind of help you because the natural language part is the part which works with machine learning. Um, so yeah, um, however, there, there are also uh, the tools which you can provide to then actually communicate something. So for example here, like what can you see from this point? And, uh, and this is again the kind of the bird view Thing, but we are actually in 3D, so people tend to forget. So means we can provide interfaces which people actually know. Or like my mom, she can use uh, Street View <laughs> to actually really explore um, how how the um, how does it look like. Uh, she doesn't use a 3D tool to fly around and tumble around the city. Um, however, street tools you can use, and it's actually, it again goes back to young Gale and his human scale. Um, this scale, this view, is probably the most important, and uh, so you we better provide tools to actually uh, show it. And of course, when we are here, we are also entering the age of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, both, I would say, are still like three years away from coming mainstream. But um, if there is one place where uh, virtual reality and augmented reality makes sense beyond gaming, then it's urban planning and urban design. Um, so um, here is a, here is a movie uh, from. This is basically a, for CD Engine, we provide a Unreal experience, so for the Unreal Engine, um, for VR. What you see here is Pasadena, um, city of Pasadena again, <clears throat> and this redevelopment uh, there, the South Fair Oaks redevelopment. And uh, so what you see here is a table, and you can interact with this table. Pretty much, again, we are in the bird view. Um, it's pretty good to actually really walk around the table and look at it from different angles. Um, and also, um, it's good to actually, especially in these days today, uh, to actually really uh, be remote 
and actually be worked on the same 3D model and having two people or three people in there discussing the model in virtual reality, for example. But then, of course, you can jump in into the model and then you have the viewpoints and you can explore now um, how, yeah, how the urban design changes the, um, the yeah, the, the view also. What are the changes uh, from a, from an urban viewpoint? Here now, jumping to other viewpoints uh, on the balcony now and back to the office. Um, so, I mean, like kind of a side note, what's kind of interesting is that um, very often when we're showing these tools about this kind of 360 views, what we hear very often is that um, urban planners um, very often they don't like this so much. Uh, especially they like it when the views are fixed. Um, so when when you basically have one uh, fixed viewpoint and you can look around there. However, they don't like so much when you can actually freely walk around in the in the road. Why is that? Um, yeah, um, because very often the urban planning uh, there. Yeah, urban plans or master plans, they can look very scary. Um, so is it a problem a problem of the process or a problem of the master plan or a problem of the design? Mm. I don't know. Um, I mean, in car design, you try to make that the car looks nice from every angle, like really every angle. So probably you should try to do the same for, um, for, for urban design. Um, but yeah. Anyway, back to the back to the um, actual uh, uh, yeah um, outreach part. So I think the outreach part is m most probably the most important part of urban design, which we don't really uh, think we don't really have it under control at the moment with digital tools, um, and we could improve that and. Uh, so of course we can provide VSS, we can, for example, provide tools that the outreach activities can be managed. So the city needs to manage all these different activities over years to until the plan gets uh, realized. We need to really foster the, uh, the dialogue with digital tools, like we just saw, um, tools that are accessible. Um, and we really need to be able to feed these inputs back then into the design iteration. However, we as, as tool makers, uh, we can kind of provide these tools, but um, what's still kind of the challenge, uh, what we cannot solve is basically that still an open and simple messaging is needed. So if the messaging is too complicated, um, then I think, uh, the message of a of urban plan or urban design, um, then you think even the best tools cannot help. So um, means, but yeah, I think it's really kind of the idea that we are building these urban planning uh, urban planning systems, which are there to really also make build the bridge between the planners and the citizens, and uh, and yeah, really enable kind of a next a next uh, level of uh, uh, a next yeah, uh, age of urban design, which has more computers, um, but, but I hope also with better cities. So back to the initial question from Christopher Alexander. Um, most of the difficulties of design are not of the computer of the sort. Is it still true today? Um, I mean, I think we have more automation and I think there also will be more automation coming. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I think the cities are getting better. I think we are learning. And, but I also think there will be another chain checkups and the young girl in, in the net in 40 years. I'm pretty sure. Um, I'm pretty sure we will run into into um, these problems again and uh, and of course the tool very often influences design we saw that in the past um, but 
it shouldn't. Um, the tool should be a tool, and uh, and yeah. But again, uh, young Gail will come and save the day. Um, however, so back to Christopher Alexander. My from my point of view, um, it's uh, it's. I would change it. I would say some of the difficulties of design are not of the complicated sort. I think it got much. Uh, I think we solved a few problems. So and uh, I think uh, yeah, it, it we are we are kind of uh, we can solve some problems with computers and uh, we can try to improve and help uh, in the urban design. But still, there is of course a lot of uh, humans are needed. So this kind of concludes my talk. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, no, we can we cannot really clap. It doesn't work very well, but um, can, I think um, we can uh, shake, move our hands, and <laughs> congratulate. Yeah, and we, we have we have the clap uh, icon. Yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think it's a uh, it's a. Uh, I can only thank you for this uh, very complete um, presentation and and uh, also presentation of your work and I think like also critical take on on the whole uh, question of um, visualization and uh, design and the role that the technology plays in it. So I think it's it's really uh, very interesting. There's so many. Uh, aspects that you touch upon that are related to the to the topics that we actually want to discuss uh, in this series. I think also you touch upon a lot of um, elements that are related to what uh, previous um, speakers and some of our guests also discussed. Um, so I think it's a really nice way to um, to 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 discuss. There is of course the uh, kind of um, condition that uh, we are that most of the planet is at the very moment, which I think is a kind of a overarching topic that, uh, that, that of course forces us to question certain thing. You mentioned the kind of uh, automatization of a lot of tasks. I think that this is a, also a, a point where, um, where we, could, uh, we could start the discussion, but maybe I just um, put out there uh, the, the, one of the meta question that we had uh, and that uh, Milica and I discussed when we were putting uh, this, uh, this kind of series together. And uh, this is also a, a very good occasion to, to drag uh, Fabio Gramazio in this conversation, because I think that um, at ETH and possibly in other um, school as well, there is a kind of, um, let's say, um, divide or split between certain um, directions uh, or let's say certain um, uh, let's say, not schools, but like fields in the discipline, within the planning disciplines, where basically um, the, the technology people do their thing and the territorial people do their thing and the architects do their thing. And somehow the kind of uh, the, the debate is kind of a bit absent. So I think that's also, uh, also to kind of um, place that conversation in, in the kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, at the, in the agenda, which is to open up that actually, uh, that, that, that kind of uh, um, conversation for, for the critical insight um, that we're actually after. So one of these main question was, um, does technology have politics? Um, and I think that one of the, you talked a little bit about the data, uh, we also uh, discussed earlier in the series about smart cities and there was a very clear um, assumption or let's say there was a clear uh, commentary that um, for instance data is not neutral right um, that it is by default um, tainted right um, so um, I think that's maybe one of the meta question, but I don't want to kind of throw you uh, immediately into that because it's a, it's a bit of a, a tricky question. Maybe Milica would like to um, uh, maybe pick up on that uh, or we just uh, ask Fabio to also kind of discuss that with you. Mm. And Pascal, can you stop sharing your screen so that we um, actually have the floor More for people. the speakers? Thank yeah. you. 
Shall I jump in? I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, Fabio, please, uh, please do. I, I have uh, also many questions, so I'll be happy to, to jump after you and okay. uh, just to greet. Uh, uh, I see some friends and colleagues in the audience uh, whom I haven't seen in a long time, for instance, uh, Ibai Rigby and Stefan Arizona, welcome. And so we look forward to also hear you in the, in the debate. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, thanks a lot, uh, Pascal, for the great <clears throat> sort of uh, overview. I mean, this is, uh, I remember, City Engine, when it was came out, it was a flash. It's been a long time, but the question still is the same. And I think uh, with uh, Christopher Alexander, you nailed it down very directly. So is design a computational problem? And uh, I think there it's also where it, be it, be it, become very, it becomes uh, directly politics because my, my uh, opinion is that technology per se is neutral, but as soon as you uh, use it, so think of what you could use it for, that it becomes uh, eminently politics, a political issue. But let's go back to this uh, question uh, if whether design can be uh, computed. I must say, personally, until about a year ago, uh, I was convinced that design could not be turned into a purely computational problem. And this sounds a bit strange because our work is very much related since ever with technology. You know, science sounds like a contradiction, but uh, for us, it's a very productive uh, contradiction. So basically you say, we say, and also uh, Pascal was, was talking about it, we say technology is a very powerful tool. It's an intellectual tool and is a, it's a craft, so a practical tool to, to modify data or material and whatever. But if you look at it in this way, this uh, endless discussion about, you know, that it probably is inscribed at the very beginning of, uh, let's say, our technological understanding of our society you know, the machine against the human uh, labor, uh, capital, you know, there is this whole construct that has been built up in the last 250 years, uh, which is a history of uh, opposition, you know, of competition, uh, falls short if you uh, just look at technology, and that's what, this is what we do as a tool. And if it's digital technology, it's just a powerful tool. You know, if you go back 200 years, the first mechanical machines, you know, that were used by people to uh, improve the way they, they did things, you know, were, were nothing different. But what we think is, if, if you put the human at the center, you know, then you get rid of the whole dichotomy and uh, uh, also allow for an identification with the technology because the technology is not something foreign. It's not something that imposed is imposed to you as a creative, but it's something you look for, something you work with, something you improve. You know, it's a bit it's a bit romantic, you know. But actually, we are romantic from this point of view. But let's get back to the question: Why uh, I said until a year ago, I was convinced that computers would not uh, become meaningful in terms of design. You know, the design Pascal was showing a bit when it came to the floor plan, you know, when it's not so much about data and big data anymore, you know, but when this design space becomes extremely complex, you know, and one little thing that maybe is a cultural issue that you cannot really encode makes the difference, decides if something is good or bad in this very moment, uh, in this specific place, you know, because design is contextual by, by nature. Uh, so a year ago, I was at, uh, at uh, a symposium. It was a symposium about the digitalization. I mean, I go to many of these events. Most of the time, it's pretty boring. 
there I was very interested because it was in a different context. It was uh, film people, so movie industry. And they were reflecting about how digital tools change their uh, just daily work and their industry in the last 10 years, showing this crazy, uh, you know, uh, I forgot how they call it, so pre-production. So they, they were able to simulate everything and uh, so they have a perfect plan, then they go to the location if needed and they're super efficient. And in, a, in the break, I was talking to a guy doing small talk and he was a screen uh, play writer. You know, a Swiss guy, a uh, famous guy. So he does, did the most uh, uh, successful uh, TV series, Swiss TV series. And he told me that he is seriously concerned that in a few years, a, an algorithm, so a machine learning algorithm will be able to substitute what he does. And I laughed and says, I said, I don't believe, you know, because think of, you know, a movie, <laughs> a movie. Think of, you know, if you want to connect a few things, think of uh, Kubrick, uh, uh, Space Odyssey, you know, the complexity of this movie, you know, he was also advised, this has connection to artificial intelligence from the topic and uh, the uh, Marvin Vinsky as an advisor and so on. And I said, no, I don't believe. And uh, as I don't believe it, I don't believe that a uh, computer will be able to design a clever floor plan. And then he said, you're stupid, you know, because you just think of the last 2%, you know, the game changers, you know, but you forget the other 98%, which is just good application of known rules, the change in time. And then we are back to these big books, you know, which for a human that didn't exist 50 years ago, by the way, you know, this has accumulated, you know, that for a human, they are not readable anymore. So we cannot, as designers, connect all this information in a meaningful and productive way, you know. So basically he said, and there, there I started to suspect that I was just being naive, you know, being elitarian, just thinking at the top 2% that changed the rule of the game and forgetting that through this high density of rules, we are basically giving away design to machines. You know, if I change the perspective. And in these terms, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, that uh, probably it will not be the most excellent architecture ever, but machines just I put it there, throw it there as a provocation, will be able to produce average, even high standard average solutions, you know, at an incredible speed. So putting us out of business, you know, this is dramatic. So now the question at the end is not if this is true or, or not. The question is, if it comes that far, why did it happen, you know? My personal analysis there is that we should go back to the human, you know, so reduce dramatically all these rules, you know, that are ideal, you know, make us, you know, look like stupid uh, in comparison with a machine <clears throat> and start to believe again in, in common sense, you know, and professionalism. Right. Then using very powerful tools, I'm not excluding the tools, you know, very powerful tools to understand things that are too complex, but at the end, making the decision ourselves. Yeah. Emilio, this was a bit long, but yeah. No, yeah. no, I think it's it's a uh, it's it's very interesting. I mean, this is we we're, we're all um, we're all very. I think <laughs> something that we all we all ponder upon, and and especially in these times. I mean, I think everyone is a little bit worried that at one point uh, we will make be made redundant. Um, so I think that is an absolutely um, timely question. Milita, do you want to pick up? Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I, I find it uh, extremely uh, enlightening what we just heard from, from Pascal and from Fabio, and uh, especially how you phrased it uh, is really powerful and clear. So the, the kind of that, that uh, in a way threat of automation and of machine learning is an actual threat due to our own uh, 
um, uh, let's say, um, to say so, preparation of the ground in the sense of, of over-regulation of various practices and we, to say so, hand over those practices to the possibility of, of machine learning. And, uh, and uh, so, for example, um, we have already seen, I believe, uh, um, um, you know, let's say the, it is very clear that the pr production of, uh, uh, let's say, individual homes in Switzerland is, is driven by the kind of a catalog uh, house market and so on. And students at ETH have already played with the idea that those are completely computable uh, kind of a typical uh, types of solutions, you know, so many types of windows, so many types of doors, uh, typical solutions in the in the floor plans and so on. So this is uh, this is very clear. However, I would uh, I would uh, perhaps like to propose that as a, as a form of politics uh, in these powerful tools that. Uh, uh, let's say Ezri is working on, and certainly um, uh, Gramatio Kohler, and um, you know, in the in the manner of using technology, I would like to I would like to ask a question: uh, What is what is the the reality of uh, of uh, or or the possibility of a kind of a ecological politics, if if I could call it that, because. Uh, I would also, I would, uh, I would, uh, let's say, looking at uh, examples shown by, by Pascal, uh, you know, what I, what I see as a design problematic is to say so the volume, uh, you know, the the assumption is to say so inbuilt in many of those drawings that these are kind of a prefab uh, concrete uh, panel structures or something like that, and I think we are at the point in uh, in a design um, let's say culture to to really consider the the kind of uh, embodied energy the, the co2 um, um, uh, let's say performance of the various materials i think we we need to be thinking as a basis of design about uh, you know carbon emissions about um, material flows about uh, uh, pollution effects about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, biodiversity, about soil. We need to integrate much more with, the, with really, let's say, landscape and ecological and ecosystem questions. And this kind of integration is not yet performed seriously, but I think it, it comes much more to the fore. And I think that this experience of the pandemic has also pushed it to the fore, right? I mean, in a way, we, we are, to say so, beginning to debate very clearly the question that, that uh, you know, limits of urban civilization pretty much have to do with the, with the kind of pressure that we are also applying on the natural world, right? So I think until recently, it was almost not possible to discuss this, right? So, so so I would I would ask Pascal to to what extent uh, uh, let's say tools such as uh, Argis Urban could also be Argis <laughs> let's say planet meaning you know the human and the non-human the the urban and the non-urban the the you know the the living world and the uh, you know at, at large right. How, how much can we capture the world beyond the city that city is dependent on? I, I would, I would uh, let's say, suggest, and I think that this, this perhaps is also by default the kind of path that would uh, <laughs> destabilize, to say so, our rules, because I think the, the, the amount of the unknown is far greater, and also we would, uh, the, the, our, to say so, rule based systems would would uh, uh, be destabilized i believe in in uh, in that approach which uh, which uh, to say so um, uh, which has a, a much more uh, a much more of an ambition to address the ecological crisis and i i think that also the the notion of human at the center is perhaps one that we should uh, 
uh, reconsider, you know, and this precisely in this discussion about, you know, what is Anthropocene, what is the role of the human, so perhaps, you know, we can go philosophically to the idea of the, of the post-Anthropocene, you know, that so we are certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, one, one of the centers, right? So let's say the idea of a kind of decentered world in which there are also other, other, uh, other, uh, uh, to say, so other centers to be considered, right? So let's say, so, so, uh, so this would, uh, this would, let's say, be the, 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 the question to, to Pascal, which is also technical and to Fabio, perhaps more on a kind of a philosophical <laughs> level, let's say. And, uh, and then I'm once again, really looking forward to hear from the audience and I'm happy to, to see many, uh, many, many um, guests that, that uh, haven't been with us so far. So welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, I mean, um, let me first say a few words to Fabio. Um, I think the, um, the, I think there's, I was, I think for architectural design, I think it is true that, uh, the, we are building buildings since 2000 years, since Vitruvia or something kind of like a bit kind of with a system. And I think we, fig we really figured it out and we really can encode it. Yes. Probably not, not the great buildings, but the, the not so great ones, as you said. And uh, however, urban design, I, I don't think we figured that out, <laughs> not at all. Um, uh, we are on it, but we are there. And then I think we also have to consider that machine learning kind of reached the plateau um, at the moment. And maybe with quantum computing in like 10 years or something, it goes on again, but so I think the screenwriter, um, I think he might be kind of lucky <laughs> because I think the technology is almost there, but uh, yeah, I think machine learning doesn't continue like this at the moment. It's like there, um, but uh, yeah, of course I said uh, in, in, in text and, and picture and video, um, the machine learning techniques are good. Um, so yeah, but I completely agree there. This, um, but f I think for urban design, um, I mean, um, also from an ecological point of view, um, it is fact that uh, yeah, cities are built around people, and more and more of the people go to the cities. So um, yes, how do you? How do you um, yeah, build uh, a system uh, for a city which respects nature and uh, but also uh, the human? Um, of course, these are challenges, and um, we see, like for example, with Archie Serban, you also have indicators like uh, um, uh, like about sustainability, about like how much CO2 and all this kind of, also green courage, for example. And then there is also the policies which cities can do, like for example, Singapore which basically says like, you have to basically replace the green space you are destroying somewhere. Um, can be on the roof or whatever, this kind of things to, um, so means these are, kind of computational methods, how you can actually enforce and enable uh, that nature um, li lives and, and thrives in the city. And as, for example, young Gail said, I think making cities green is probably the biggest trend we are having also as a, as a, as a tool maker. Um, of course, one big thing is about the densities and about these blocks and uh, which mm -hmm. look which look very very scary. But on the other hand, um, they all want to make the city screen. So this is probably a very good development. And uh, and and with these visualization tools like Unreal Engine, etc., you can actually really visualize how how better it is. And now regarding ArcGIS. 
planet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe I have what? a new name in the meantime, RGS Earth. You know, like Bucky Fuller Spaceship okay. Earth, right? Actually, RGS Earth exists. <laughs> Oh yes, um, okay. sorry about that. So maybe then planet. <laughs> uh, no, um, no, but I think ArcGIS is actually, or A3 is actually, is uh, I think the planet on a planetary mission um, means it is a geographic information system. It's used everywhere. It's used by forestry. It's used by. Um, um by climate scientists um it's used by everybody and um yeah um however we only do the technology side of the things there all right and i think this is this is a kind of a big problem or like i think the um the marketing manager of the climate change uh, is yeah he has problems like uh um, it doesn't it doesn't work out like from an outreach point of view like people are still discussing about it instead of doing something um, so this is uh, this is probably a planetary uh, uh, problem um, we just try to basically make tools in Zurich for to solve these little problems for the cities and actually enable the cities that they don't but they actually discuss these things and kind of try to contribute what we can there on the urban planning, urban design space. But of course, I agree. Um, we also need uh, uh, more tools for an um, outreach um, on a planetary scale, but this is a pretty big problem. But I think if I may, challenge. if I may just pick up on that, because I think it's really interesting to, to, uh, to see how you, how you, um, how you phrase it. And then maybe Fabio can, uh, can uh, also pick up. I think it's anyway related. It's somehow um, one, one of you say, so the PR manager of uh, the climate change conversation <laughs> is, <laughs> is bad or is not, you know, um, and I think that's interesting how you, how you put that, you know, as if it was a client, which in fact, I think is the right approach. And I also wonder why, and I think it's maybe related to the fact that these kind of tools are related to a certain narrative of progress and of, you know, um, urban development. So it's about the more and not the less, no, in a way, uh, in, in regard to the products. And I think that um, uh, in a way, it's a fantastic tool at, at the disposal of uh, uh, anyone who actually picks it up, but the ones who pick it up are actually the ones who are, in a way, I mean, I'm the one to make myself unpopular, but I will, um, that are actually problematic because, you know, it's about, uh, I mean, you showed that example, which I think is very talking, um, uh, which is this kind of machine learning design, Bosco Verticale, and Bosco Verticale is like, you know, it's it's the worst thing that one can actually um, present as being sustainable. It's a complete fake i think that's something that everyone deep inside knows it's about planting trees on balconies which is not solving anything i mean it's a marketing tool so just to kind of put it out there i think that there is this kind of fantastic tools at the disposal of people but somehow there is only a certain type of clients for this and when you talk about the pr of climate change i think that there is a, a kind of untapped um, aspect of these kind of tools, they should be embraced by, by you know, critical um, artists, uh, critical thinkers. Some people do that, but in a way, it feels like the immense clients that Esri or, you know, GIS um, actually serves are more, um, you know, in the kind of narrative of progress, uh, development, more construction, you know, things like that. And actually, why not use it as a revert tool? I think that's what Melissa was also saying when she talked about the non-human at the center, where you can actually look at things um, as being, uh, you know, used to generate certain visual. And I think the visual is in itself a whole strand of conversation. I don't know if we'll get there, but yeah. I think that there is a kind of... Um, yeah, I think there is a, there is a kind of un, un, unsolved issue here, which I think could be actually something interesting for Esri if you were to ever actually wander a, a, a path that would be, um, you know, discussing with activists or with like critical thinkers and people who would actually be able to generate new visions for cities that are not necessarily in your coding yet, in fact, because they don't, they're not part of, 
what we know how to do, you know? I, I, yeah, Milica, sorry. I'm... I mean, I, I would just, just, to, uh, just to, to clarify one line. So, so uh, I think that essentially this urban pl problem has to be answered not at the urban level, but I would say at the planetary level. So I think this is this is really a kind of a my my essential insight. We cannot, uh, to say so, reason urban design from urban scale. We have to go one scale bigger and then to say so, uh, move down, right? So this is why I I kind of insist on this kind of larger scale as a as a starting scale for the kind of conceptual consideration, right? So this is, this is the, um, uh, let's say, uh, scale at which we consider the impact of cities, right? In the, you know, in the, to say so, land, in the, in the nature, you know, where does the food come from? How resources are consumed? How landscape is being reorganized, et cetera, et cetera. And I think from, from that, we could we could come to a very different narrative about cities and about urbanization, and I think this arc GIS tools would be incredibly powerful to construct that critical narrative, right? Of the kind of a of of a kind of a. I think this is where we should be searching for for balance, if ever kind of balance was possible to be made, right? And I, there was a very powerful image. Uh, uh, a few a few few days ago, tweeted all over the world uh, of this kind of drop in the nitrogen dioxide pollution uh, as a, as a consequence of uh, uh, you know reduction in the in the you know traffic, air travel, uh, industrial production, all of that, and you know the the commentary was something like everybody said it was impossible right and you know look suddenly it happened right and i think if we if we were able to unpack this type of uh let's say <laughs> simulations or use data at that scale which is really a macro scale it's kind of entire continent you know like china and you know we are able to pull the data to show the certain uh, you know possible ramifications of doing you know, thing A or thing B, you know, with, with our, to say so, you know, uh, uh, emissions or, or whatever, material flows or whatever, you know, I think then we, we could perhaps really come to some, some really powerful, powerful ideas. I mean, th this is perhaps, uh, this is maybe I'm, I'm dreaming too much, but I would love to, to, to work on with, the, with this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, scales uh, with, uh, with the ARC uh, GIS tools. I'm curious, maybe Pascal, you, you can tell me later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I can, uh, I can easily can give done, you... Know, what can be done? <laughs> I know, I can, I, can, I can give you a few contacts. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, no, for sure, there are, there are many people actually thinking like you and uh, actually working with Esri on these things. So like, uh, all right, I think the good thing is that Esri is a private company and uh, so you know, in the stock market or whatever. And uh, also have, it really has kind of like, I think a, a really good mission. And also the founder, Jack Benjamin is actually a really good person. So, um, so I mean, there, there are these kind of global um, activities or so one is for example, this guy who wants to plant, uh, I don't know, like 10 billion trees. Like, and he's actually really doing it. <laughs> And uh, also via ETH, by the way. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they, they are they are using our tools, and this is like on a this is like think big scale, or and uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, back to your like. I think there are tools like we also have actually uh, uses who lose, for example, arches urban from uh, one level higher on the county level. So it means they actually have like 10, 10 cities below. So yeah, we have these kind of users, but um, for me, it's kind of like, I think the cities itself, they, they are responsible for a lot of these <laughs> emissions. And uh, the city governments, uh, the local government is also something where Esri is actually very well connected and where we actually can move things. So local governments is one of our biggest markets and this is something where we can basically improve the world by 
brain to uh, yeah, um, make tools that give more insights, that in, uh, enable better planning, that enable more what if scenarios, um, better visualizations, better understanding, um, all these things. Um, so yeah, it's just like, I'm just one department of SV. Don't forget. <laughs> That's fair. Fabio, do you want to continue? I wrote down a few things on what what I heard right now. Uh, first of all, let, let's get back quickly to this uh, question of urban design versus, say, building scale design, floor plan design, just to simplify extremely. Uh, I agree with Pascal. Uh, probably uh, the the at the level of urban design, this doesn't work uh, just because of complexity and because there are too many parameters that you cannot encode, uh, which the, the algorithm or machine learning cannot make sense of. But in my mind, this is very good news, you know, because the tools an urban designer uh, has right now, and I would extend this, you know, in a proactive way saying, it's not just the tools you can download and buy, but it's also the tool a community can develop on a specific question, you know, so if you can start to customize things, uh, because then the risk that the tool does the design or influence the design shrinks a bit, you know, this is an extreme, it's exactly what I uh, understand as being the attractive sweet spot. So if you have a human in the center, you know, but the human, instead of ignoring the reality, and the reality is the only thing we can use to design with, you know, uh, uses and modifies and uh, you know, instrumentalizes technology, you know, uh, for design. And now the question is, what is design? You know, if I ask a developer, who <clears throat> says design is a thing that works that I can sell and that costs uh, as little as possible, so optimize it. You know, at the level of the city, this is a more complex question because there, not, there is not just a developer; there is a community. There are uh, there is politics, there is a government, uh, you know, there is different uh, philosophies, uh, stakeholders, and so on. If I, if I look at the, at the building, then there for me it gets scary <clears throat> because, you know, if I don't want to reinvent housing, for example, <clears throat> the problem of packing 200 apartments in a block, you know, is for me, I'm not an expert, but I would say this is a typical uh, machine learning problem because it's just about optimizing the last 2%. Nobody, no, nobody wants something new. You know, you want what is already there, but you want 2% more, percent more performance. And there the machine is <clears throat> so much superior to us, you know, to, <clears throat> to find out which combination could be slightly better. And the other striking problem is a machine can produce 20 version in one second, you know. Me as an architect, even if I'm experienced, it takes me two weeks to come up with a rough sketch that then I have to work out, you know. So if the client asks me five, five, five version, I'm out of, out, out of business. You know? So there for me, it has already happened. Now to the second question, uh, the relationship of these tools to bigger problems of uh, design, sustainability, but to Militza brought in right now, right. as before. There, I think, uh, of course, going back to my first statement, if you have powerful tools, then you can understand dependency, then you can possibly make better decisions, political decisions, and then also that, that then reverber down to design decision decisions, but even not being an, an urban planner at all, I often have the impression that uh, as planners, as architects, often we are so concentrated on certain things we do, for example, the plan, you know, that we forget the geometry often in architecture is just one small part of the big problem. You know, look now, you know, we're sitting here uh, because of Corona, and we are having a very interesting discussion online. A month ago, this would have been unthinkable. You know, in the last month, I would have been once in the U.S. and once in Singapore. I don't know what for. 
you know. So being able to reframe certain things and to, you know, uh, imagine, because it's about being able to imagine things, because the technology is here, you know, we experience it every day. But being able to imagine it that we could think and act globally by living locally, you know, and that this would not be a contradiction uh, of terms per se, is an interesting finding. And I think this is much more interesting than some green facades, you know, come going back to, to, to Charlotte, you know, this is, I mean, a green sky rise can be a strong sign. I'm not, I mean, against it, you know, can be a statement, but more and more often it's just greenwashing, you know. So 90% of the time it's just greenwashing, it's PR, you know, and, and uh, the effect of something like this compared, you know, for example, with just flying, you know, out of your neighborhood or in the world when there is a real need or reason is ridiculous. You know. But we, we also know that uh, actually the construction industry is one of the most polluting um, uh, you know, industry in any case. So it's, it's always relative. But um, <clears throat> I, I think it's, it's, really, it's really going into a very interesting direction. And I, I just wanted to go back to one of the aspects that I picked up earlier, which is this relation to uh, images, which I think is, uh, is, is maybe also um, interesting to, to uh, let's say, to, to dig upon, because it's, it has this kind of, I think it's interesting, Pascal, when you say that um, urban planners uh, did not like the kind of um, uh, mobile uh, experience in, in their own design, right? Where, which is kind of, you know, showing, angles that you maybe didn't really thought were so interesting and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there is this question with um, how, how does the, the tool um, kind of, in a way, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to the code question because I think, and it relates to this idea that certain things do not really exist. I mean, you build up in a kind of canon, right? There is the canon of what is uh, architectural language. You started with that very funny um, little animation of the, a kind of a sacrilegious uh, uh, exercise on the on the Villa Savoie. I mean, there is a certain uh, amount of canon, right? Uh, the canon has said architecture is that. I think that Fabio in his work has also challenged very much that, but somehow the things that Fabio does or did, um, uh, I'm thinking about this kind of uh, very beautiful walls and so on and so forth. This is not appearing at all in the kind of uh, images that uh, that are produced by the by the by the by the, the program. So in a way, it feels like there is also a certain leveling or a kind of um, yeah, standardization of what the city is looking like, which I think is is where I was heading when you know Fabio said you know we want two hundred flats in this thing and we want a Osmanian facade. Is there kind of a possibility to reinvent these things and then going further to um, to, to think about these territorial things, you know, like, are we able to actually use these tools to project things that are not in the code? That's, that's what I, I mean, I don't, I'm not a coding expert, but I, I know that there is always, and there is always labor, right? There is somebody that is doing the code, the little hands, and the code and the machine also needs uh, maintenance. But that's maybe another question. I mean, of course, of course, the aesthetic, aesthetic aspect is important. I mean, knowing that aesthetic is not just about the physical beauty, but the kind of understood values of certain, you know, situations, no? So do we, do we want to see this kind of huge roads filled with concrete, this kind of a square blocks, you know, that's uh, made out of concrete, etc. So in a way, how the tool should should to say so lend itself to the possibility of of a true, let's say, aesthetic invention. And aesthetic is, of course, uh, you know, more than more than just a kind of a, a, a facade, right? I mean, of course, it's a, it's to say so a, a truly exciting, you know. Uh, um, vision of the future right so i think this is this is an important important aspect right so what what does the tool really um what are the the underlying parameters that one works with you know what are what are the aspects that you know the tool 
enables you to do what? To arrange volumes out of concrete. You know, I would say it's not enough, right? So this is this is the point, right? So let, let's say what 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 do what kind of repertoire we need to unpack in those tools, right? But I don't think it's I said it before, it's not about the tool, it's about you asking the tool what you would like to have. And if you are there, then you become author again. It doesn't matter how powerful the tool is. So it's about the hierarchy. If you expect the tool to be as good as possible, you know, and possibly delivered by somebody else. So an entity that is outside of architecture, outside of the discourse, you know, the, the Silicon Valley company, then we are on the wrong track. You know, we should humanize these things and also be aware that technology has always been a, a grand narrative. You know, I mean, the, the image you were showing about Corbusier and these things, this was, you know, playing with this, uh, uh, projection into a you know a future that was clearly is never there you know now talking about artificial intelligence we are at the same point I mean Pascal hinted at a bit a bit you know this is we yeah. talk about artificial intelligence in 50 years you know it has, has always been almost there you know every time through several cycles <laughs> yes. Yes. But this has never been a problem. So the fact that we reason uh, and get enthusiastic and 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 uh, uh, anxious and uh, you know about this thing is an important uh, uh, sort of uh, driver to to our discourse, to 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 our society. So I don't see I don't see a, a contradiction in there. No, no, me me neither, me neither. I I also I also find it extremely. Uh, uh, rich and interesting discussion and somehow also hopeful that uh, in these, uh, you know, let's say these uh, kind of technology was also here in this pandemic as a kind of a solution. And I, I quite enjoy the kind of, uh, let's say, I mean, we are here in the Zoom, let's say, condition, but it, it is part of this kind of new creativity, right? So let's say, and, and there is really, I think, appropriate uh, to say so, <laughs> we are doing something quite uh, quite interesting with this tool, right? And I think mm -hmm. this is this is the kind of mentality around technology that I, I quite enjoy, actually. So, so, uh, so, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, let's say the the we certainly can't. Uh, can't uh, uh, solve uh, right now the, the kind of future of the tools for for urban design right but i think it's 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 uh, uh, absolutely let's say a, a, a crucial crucial and interesting mm. discussion mm. so uh, mm. so uh, i mean i i'm i would be would be happy to ask uh, pascal uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know what? What can we perhaps, as as designers or or people in academia, contribute to kind of uh, imp, imp, you know to those tools? I mean, what would be the the way for us? I mean, if if we are not to say so in the in the you know we are not let's say in the coding, but let's say there is a lot of other kind of intelligence. I mean, how how can that dialogue be opened up? I'm I'm interested in a dialogue. I mean, this would be one question. And I would, I would also ask if we can now open uh, 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 to the audience as well, because uh, because so many interesting people are with yeah. us. There is also a raised yeah. hand, but I would let uh, Pascal answer maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah first um, to your initial question, Charlotte, um, the software engineer per se, um, I think he he writes code, and uh, but typically the tools are are something you can configure. Um, maybe less and less, but so means what the software engineer is actually doing. And the software engineer, I mean the whole crew, like with product engineers, with geographers, and et cetera, in our team. But what they do is they set the defaults. So the defaults for your configuration. And now, um, if you have um, users that use the tool and don't uh, change the defaults. Yes, you have your canon of uh, <laughs> tool-driven design. Um, but I, I don't think uh, the tool is the solution or the problem here. 
also with the um, concrete blocks and the concrete streets. This is not a problem of the tool. This is a problem of politics. Um, and uh, and I think how you can help from an architectural point of view is, um, on the one hand, yes, the dialogue with us on the tool makers, but I think there's also there needs to be a dialogue with the from you guys with the politics and with the citizens and explain us how we can help with this dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because you saw it in, in the presentation, how easily you can plant the trees and create bike lanes and all this kind of stuff. And we're actually focusing on this ground level. We are not focusing on the facades and all this kind of stuff. We know it's the ground level which needs, which needs easy tools. However, it's uh, this is a political discussion with uh, you have to handle car lobby and uh, all this kind of stuff and uh, so but i think i think really um yeah of course i hear this many times uh, but i think you should not blame the tool you should blame the user of the tool mm -hmm. so uh, but, but for instance <laughs> the, are the default best practice because I, I think that's the thing if if the default settings are best practice and not uh, in a way you know, the concrete blocks. Um, in a way, you you also take a position. You know, I think I think that you're 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 trying to get away with something that is actually not uh, not totally true because you the tool has also power. The the tool really? has has the power to to project a certain image of what is a good practice, and and that is not the uh, let's throw under the bus yes, one yes. last time the the skyscraper Bosco Verticale. It's not that. So I'm just I think that there is also in the way that yeah. you use, present the tool in the yeah, different. Yeah. No, I, me as a toolmaker, I'm I'm very I'm very aware of this of this kind of um. But this is also what I mean when I say that user experience is very, very important in user interface. I'm actually aware, we got much more aware that people don't change the defaults. Uh, so it means, yes, it's actually seen as a, as a best practices. And of course, oh, to computers, yeah. to software engineers, to software engineers, the best practices of, uh, of architects, no. Uh, so that that's why we are hiring now more, more architects. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. But, but I, I would like to, to defend uh, Pascal because no, he's not being attacked. Don't no, be, but uh, it's be, but it, it, it's an, it's an important it's an important question. You know, he's the creator of a dramatically powerful tool. Exactly. And every dramatically powerful uh, 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 technology is extremely scary you know because depending on how you understand it on how you employ it you know you can get a completely different result but i agree with him that it's about how you use it and it's about you know the ambition and the intellectual capacity and education and curiosity and worldview of the user you know which makes a difference but there is another point, you know, often in architecture, we, we are very good at uh, cheating ourselves, you know, we think there is the architecture, we don't even agree on small things among each other, and then we think that there is a sort of a common understanding of things, and this is not true, you know, reality is, is conflictual, you know, different people, different groups, different stakeholders have different visions and interests, and when it comes to the city, you know, these things become visible and manifest, you know, and explicit. Mm -hmm. So the risk that even if the creator, you know, uh, uh, would do it differently, that these tools are then misused, you know, in order to pursue certain very transparent, often most of the time, you know, goals is gigantic, you know. And there the question is, where is the critical understanding of our own professions? Profession. We as architect yeah. and planners would be there, you know, theoretically, to say, wait a second, you know, you cannot use this this way. But in order to do this, first thing we should understand, we should be able to understand these things, and then we are back to education. Yeah. You know, if Absolutely. in academia we're still discussing yeah. between the digital and the analog, you know, which is a discussion that belongs in the early nineties, at best, you know. Mm -hmm. Then 
That's, yeah. It's not I, so sure the... if the people that we are, you know, outputting will be will have the intellectual tools and let's say the standing, you know, because in order to, to make a statement you have to, you know, to 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 expose themselves and to say uh, not this way, you know, or with these tools you could do other yeah. things, you know. Maybe they'll just sit in the corner and say, I don't understand these things, they're not too complex. But but you you are well, in, in the best position to do that because you are, you are have a chair. So you, you teach this criticality to your students, don't you? You you will also, Charlotte, you will also teach to your students. So I, let's, I can, uh, actually, I can I, only teach criticality. I, uh, I, uh, I will, uh, I also, I mean, I completely agree. It is, it is down to education and we, we really have to, to try and make those, make those links and, you know, use the, let's say, use the, to say, so this uh, education as a kind of a creative uh, sphere in which we can also develop, uh, develop those tools and approaches and so on as, as you're doing. I mean, I, I, I think we can, we can do a lot. And uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, it is really exciting. And I, I, uh, I would, uh, I mean, I, I really will myself uh, try to investigate what, what Argis, uh, uh, what I can do, let's say with Argis at a larger scale. So this is, this is really exciting to do, but let's, let's open for a few minutes to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there were a few, there was somebody who had actually raised a hand, I think. Um, yes. Uh, yes, I think Ramon Perez, or was it a, a mistake? No one is picking up, hello. Um, okay, are there uh, questions? Um. Yes. Maybe I would just like to say, um, of course, it's about the education, but it's also about the transparency of the tools. No, so I think that's also something uh, we have to 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 work on, or software engineers mm -hmm. maybe have to work on. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, that this is also kind of like, especially regarding the data, that people actually can really understand what this kind of the message which has been created how it has been created and where is the data coming from, how has it been segmented, how has it been filtered, all this kind of thing. Um, so yes, this is this is our, I think, as a, as a tool makers, we have to um, be aware of this. That's what the kind of what I meant with the technology first. Uh, it's, yeah, we put out the technology and then, especially when it's kind of out of the box technology, which you cannot configure anymore. Um, that's we need to be aware of the consequences of this. So I think this discussion is very relevant for us and we really start to realize the responsibility which we are also having in this in this part and in, the, and in this in this game. And uh, yeah, but I think especially the transparency is uh, that we need the understanding of how is something built. And this also helps that the things are in JavaScript, so everybody can actually go into the code somehow, all these kind of things. Uh, this helps also. Yeah, but I, I, I think when transparency is the, 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 the basic layer of everything, you know, I cannot imagine, I mean, if we at ETH educate people that would even consider to work with a tool, to do design with a tool that they don't understand, you know, that we have a fundamental problem, you know, because then we could just say, okay, here we are uncritical and naive, or we are enslaved to technology, you know, but I think that the, the, the fundamental moment, moment is understanding what you're doing, you know, and this right. needs criticality, needs yes. curiosity, and then the next step of this, and this is what Pascal was mentioning with the language, you know, is also demystifying technology to a certain extent, finding out that things are, yes, complex, but also, you know, to a certain uh, level, uh, customizable, you know, if you just dare, and then start to configure your own tools, and the ideally, you know, this, now we are back to romanticism, you know, ideally everybody builds its own, own tools for its own architecture. Know, yeah. we challenge ourselves and we compete with uh, you know buildings of different tools and we fight you know 
yeah. uh, uh, about, you know, and this would be a very, you know, critical, but also fresh attitude, because I think the big risks of technology are just two, you know, being uh, just uncritical, but having a technocratic attitude, or, you know, disinterested, you know, I just use it because I make more money, but I don't care what it is, how it works, and what it produces. It's very common, you know, with all yeah. uh, among architects, or the other, and this is a wrong uh, understanding of criticality, let's say, I don't use technology because I'm critical, you know. This yeah, is yeah, as, of as, course. As this bad, is, this is as bad, you know, as just adopting it uncritically. You yeah. Know, you just propel you, you know, you project your, our, our, our side of reality and of every, you know, meaningful contribution. Yes, yes, this. yes, of course. This is a very, very an interesting, uh, indeed, uh, position. So, so uh, I see a very, very uh, um, interesting uh, comment in the chat by Scott Morehouse that goes in the same direction. Fabio, would you like Scott to join us? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wrote, wrote my little question there. I think everybody can see it and maybe I'd like comments from the the, 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 the speakers on on how you know this deals with how the the act, uh, how, how we can train people to think and how we can have an impact on on uh, our communities that are larger than just working on a, a project by project basis or, or working on narrow research topics should I mean my my as I said, I'm not a, a an urban planner, so this is not things that I experience in first person. It's more upon observation. My my feeling is that, and this is right now a very unpopular thing to say, uh, probably, and uh, you're very quickly stamped as neoliberal. Uh, but I'm I'm still convinced. <laughs> you know, of my own experience that in order to avoid running into the trap of artificial intelligence of hyper uh, optimization uh, and all those things, we should radically uh, question and reduce the rules and start to rely again on discussions, you know, from bottom up on uh, common sense, you know, and professionalism, because if we have a billion, a million rules, you know, that uh, an intelligent young person cannot even read through, you know, uh, then we have a problem, you know, it means that we don't trust this person, we don't trust what he learned, don't trust his critical, under, his critical, crit, or critical understanding about reality. And I don't know if this goes uh, in the direction of the question, but yeah. Yeah. Think. Maybe I mean, it's, about, it's again, it's again I mean, about it's, transparency. Uh, yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, I think that uh, common sense is uh, is uh, interesting. We we could do entire lecture series, Charlotte. If ever you are ready for this, or like <laughs> Fabio, we do it together. Let's do always, let's always. do another one next year on urbanism of the com of common sense. Common sense. That's and how this might work. <laughs> <laughs> because we will come to all sorts of problems that are rather political and have to do with the, with the, you know, with the kind of processes of decision making in a society. So this is this is Pascal's challenge number three. But uh, I think we, I think it needs uh, indeed uh, needs to be tackled. You know, needs to be tackled. So, um, so I mean, uh, indeed, it comes. Uh, I think it uh, it does come uh, uh, also back to the question of education because we we train uh, you know we would ideally train uh, architects to formulate the problems to answer them within a kind of a process that they are able to to partly also set up themselves you know so this is the kind of a position not just somebody who can to say so interpret and apply the rules but literally to to, to, to sort of be able to, to design the whole path of, of a decision making and even to formulate the problem. I also would like to just go, go back for a moment to, to one sentence that, that uh, 
uh, that uh, Scott uh, wrote in his uh, chat uh, question, which I like very much. How can we make the implications and unintended consequences of policy decisions more visible? So I think that this, uh, this is perhaps where, where really the, the, these tools are incredibly interesting in kind of trying to uh, not only to say so to sell our ideas in the political arena, but to, to literally to say so clarify the complexity to ourselves in the design process. I think this is where where there is a huge, um, uh, you know, I think huge field, uh, you know, where where we where we where we you know can do a lot at uh, at the urban level at the territorial level and and using precisely the kind of tools that pascal pascal showed right so kind of really um uh, i think we we have uh, you know let's say with the uh, uh, precisely with ecological questions with with questions of uh, you know uh, um um, let's say, uh, I don't know, CO2 emissions, uh, air pollution, uh, uh, kind of a urban, urban climate. I mean, much, much interesting work is done. And I think there is a lot more in that direction that, that is really kind of interesting for, for let's say, urban, urban design, to say so. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that there is this, um, in this, uh, in the same alley and this kind of, um, challenge of outputs no that uh, that was the challenge number three this kind of um, uh, possible use of the tool by people that are actually not the one using the tool usually is something that could be i think interesting and i wanted to ask maybe i missed out but is there an open source version or is it always a commercial uh, tool um it's it's a uh, it's not open source but it's kind of a, the source is available like you kind of, because it's JavaScript, you can actually go in and see the source. But that so requires kind of a certain uh, level of you say, cannot, technological uh, liter literacy, no? Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, but, yeah. but I think there are kind of like um, around of it, there are many kind of components which are open source. So mm -hmm. the components, some of the components are open source and easy to use. Because I, th I think that would be one aspect if you're, I know that this is of course a kind of, a, it's a company, right? So I mean, open source is not, uh, is not exactly, but if, if uh, the, this, how to address these challenges um, is something that's, that the company is serious about, that would be uh, one possibility would be to actually make the comp. I mean, you talked about the fact that your mother can use some of the tools. I think that if your mother could actually use really the tools um, and not have to buy it and actually have, I mean, I think in a way the the open source direction is something that would actually tackle some of the aspects that you consider to be a problem in in the in the in the tool in a way as a kind of um, yeah just an, an, a kind of a response in a way. Um, are there more questions? I think yes. Um, yes? yes please, uh, can I say something? Yes. My course. name is Ramon Perez. Hi. Yes. Yes, go on. Okay. A little bit of background. My name is Ramon Perez. I'm an urban planner. Uh, in year uh, 70, one, 970, we invited Jack to work with us for the urban design of a new town in Venezuela. On that occasion, we also invited Chris Alexander as an advisor. And we also invited uh, Kevin Lynch as an advisor. And we ended up uh, planning a region using uh, the principles of uh, Ian McCarr uh, to define a good location for the new town. A, a proper city, a proper location a, in an environment that is close to the border of Colombia and Venezuela. Um, my wife and I have been working. She is also a planner. And we wrote a book for ESRI called Understanding Urban Poverty. 
GIS for the developing world. And we are actually working in understanding more poverty, urban poverty, not only in Venezuela, but also in China, India, uh, Europe, and actually in LA, in Los Angeles. We are living in Los Angeles. And we have come to the conclusion that Los Angeles is perhaps one of the most urban poor cities in the world. Most, almost 80% of the people, they live in a dorm, in a dormitory kind of uh, environment. They do not live where they work. They do not live where they uh, have a recreation or where they have to buy or where they have to get some health or get education. I mean, the problem is that uh, most cities around the world are using the functional land use model to plan the cities. And city engine is basically a tool that recognizes that there is land uses that have to be respected. Um, 65% of the whole world lives in non-planned non -planned cities. I mean, spontaneous growth of cities. So there is a need to envision the future in a different way. City Engine is a very good tool to plan for the near future, but not to plan for the future. Let me try to explain this. Uh, if you need to plan a city and bring streets and highways on that city, you are wrong. That's not the future of the cities. There is a need to change that concept that you have to think on a city where you can live where you work, live where you recreate, live where you educate, live where you look for health services. And that's a different, completely different kind of a city. Yeah. If you are working from your home right now, now you understand that you can think of a future city where people can work in their houses. Yeah. And that's a completely different yeah. city. Maybe we so, can, uh, I mean, I think that there is a, a point to touch upon and we can probably wrap up after that because I just saw that it's already, we are completely past time. Thank you very much for your comments. I think that there is one point that is, um, that I also actually was reflecting myself upon when I was listening to Pascal, which is the role of um, the kind of informal urbanization versus this kind of technologies. And I think that uh, the question that was just asked also um, pointed at the question of time. And, and Fabio was also mentioning the kind of speed of the machine versus the speed of the human. And also there is this question of the speed of urban development. You were also talking about Singapore, which is a city that kind of has a different speed of construction. Um, and, and actually this is something that we would be tempted to uh, to 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 question, no? especially these days where we're saying, you know, actually we should um, rethink about this speed of development and, and, uh, and how we deal with our, um, our growth. Um, so may maybe you could, uh, you could um, reflect upon the relation to the, to the kind of, in fact, it's true that the majority of the world lives in this informal settlement. So it's not exactly um, something that the, the engine actually deals with? Is this something that, uh, that you've looked at also and, and maybe also reflect on this question of growth? Um, and then I think we can, um, we can wrap up because we are already over time. Pascal. Um, yeah, um, I mean, 
in general, of course, we are looking at uh, what's what are the urban planning design solutions out there. Um, and I think at the moment, there are actually none. <laughs> um, means um, typically what's used is geographic information systems, um, which then get repurposed for these kind of local needs. So it means basically everybody's kind of building his own tools. Um, and uh, this has advantages and disadvantages. But uh, in general, I think there is really, there's not so many tools and also this kind of, uh, um, yeah, um, is, is true what, is, what, what Raman said, that there is like, uh, there, there are many, many parts are not planned. And this is, but these are sometimes also very nice places, sometimes maybe not. <laughs> um, but um, the problem is, this, uh, the, the, the cities grow, or like the, the planet grows, the cities grow, and there we really need to start to put some more thought into into the into how we how we build and manage cities, and uh, and this is and there I think the computer is kind of a obvious tool which kind of helps you because it it is fast mm -hmm. to generate. Um, new scenarios and what if scenarios. However, um, I, I said uh, the complexity is so high that there will always be some kind of, I think, uh, local touch <laughs> to the um, thing. And also, and also, I said, like things are changing. Maybe we are now starting the age of homework. Uh, the age of uh, remote work starts now. So everything changes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Age of remote work. That was uh, that was a question raised both by by Fabio and uh, Perez. So indeed, so uh, uh, so uh, I uh, I personally quite enjoyed uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, coincidence that uh, that this uh, let's say experience. Uh, uh, of the pandemic, extraordinary and terrifying, but gave us really kind of insights also on, on the topic that we are discussing, right? <laughs> and uh, certainly something uh, something about the future of technology and urban design. And uh, so this is kind of uh, incredible that we are, in fact, we should have had this uh, lecture in Diona in uh, Orlikon, but we are having it here in in Zoom, and maybe everybody is on a different continent, and it still works. So it's it's kind of actually, you know, there is there is optimism in the whole situation, and perhaps we can even reinvent cities with with technologies uh, uh, like like you know uh, Zoom and 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 GIS and so on. So, uh, so, and of course, with some some extra intelligence from our our side, <laughs> or shall I say, common? Shall I say, common sense? Common sense. <laughs> common sense. Yes. Um, yes. Also, so from my side, also thank you very much. I think uh, it's. Uh, I, I really enjoy this um, this kind this conversation. I think it's very. Really, um, I think it should happen actually more often because I think that there is this, I insist to say that there are this kind of chapel and, and Fabio was mentioning this kind of um, discussion analogy versus digital. And then I think that there is, there would be a, a real need to, to actually also, I mean, industry versus academia. I think that there's also kind of a, a need to, to bridge this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, you know, fields in a way, and and I think that that this kind of conversation really contributes to that. I think, um, in that sense, I, I really thank uh, Pascal and Fabio for accepting to um, step in the arena, and um, and <laughs> agree to our small arena yeah. <laughs> to be uh, to be uh, uh, our our guests. Um, I also thank everyone everyone who uh, joined from from uh, everywhere. I see that. Uh, people are, are are getting very creative with their background as well, um, but also from your living room or your bedroom. So thank you very much. Um, this is actually the last uh, um, session on territory. So uh, I, I think that uh, with with this kind of um, uh, overview, let's say from uh, uh, the very first speakers to the last speaker, somehow we managed to cover. Uh, some of the aspects that, that relate to the questions of technology and, and urbanism and also um, um, at that very 
specific moments. I mean, we managed to make three lectures and, um, and then the two uh, last one moved into the virtual um, space. Oh, three, three, two, two and three. The three were virtual. All uh, Stodistrom was the first. Ah, yes, three. I, I forgot somehow I, I yeah. had it in mind or something. So it's two, two versus three, exactly. So we're, it's more of a virtual um, experience in the end. I think uh, somehow the stuff we discussed maybe helped us to, to deal with this, uh, with this situation. I think the question of technology has been so present and never um, as before have we actually been forced to deal with it. And I think that um, the conversation generally helps to, to manage that. Um, so I would just thank everyone who actually um, uh, attended and uh, the students who were uh, there also three and, and thank you Milica for also letting me uh, uh, curate that series. I think it has been <laughs> not, a not at all. It was a great, a great pleasure to work with you, Charlotte, and great pleasure to to uh, well, I mean, absurdly great pleasure to to have uh, this uh, this topic running uh, in this kind of uh, uh, moment of the pandemic because uh, I think it it really kind of uh, accelerated the learning process. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. For, for being with us. Thank you, Pascal. It was great. It was great meeting you and uh, really kind of a, a very cool work. And I, I'd love to do something more in the educational context uh, in, the, in the future. Thanks, Fabio. That was, uh, that was really, really brilliant. And uh, so thanks. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Uh, hi, Ibai. Didn't uh, hear you today. Great to see you. And Thanks everyone for joining and thank you to the students who follow this, uh, this lecture series and we, we look forward to, to seeing you in other, uh, in other situations, in other courses very soon. Yes, and uh, so may I ask uh, Pascal and Fabio to stay just for a few minutes and we'll, uh, we'll just uh, have a kind of, uh, well, we could call it an apero, but I don't have anything to drink. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this is something that we would usually do. And uh, so I just ask everyone to uh, leave the meeting. Thank you very much. We are hoping to release the archives of the uh, entire lecture series by the end of the semester. You will hear about it online um, and uh, hopefully uh, you can enjoy and access the data. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, ciao. <laughs> All the best. Thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you so, so much. much. Yeah, wonderful. It's so good. There are so many Great people too. from everywhere. Uh -huh. Applause, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got an applause. That's wonderful. Thank Pascal, you. did you share it also on your networks or not so much? Yes. And I think, uh, I think there you, was... have, you attracted some cr specific crowds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I think the, before there was Jack Benjamin, the 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 owner of it. Ah, yeah, uh, amazing. Yeah, oh. <laughs> well, and uh, Scott Morehouse, he's actually he was kind of my mentor. Yes, uh, yes, very nice, interesting person, absolutely. Ah, yeah. yeah, he was your mentor. Great. Yeah, no, I mean his question was very uh, on point, actually. And uh, there is something you you have something uh, quite uh, more on the technical sides that we didn't answer to Tarit. Mm. Uh, yeah, but I now everyone. Left, so. mm. I think I, I I know this guy. Uh, okay. I can I can write him. Uh, <laughs> okay, that would be. Sorry, I I completely <laughs> missed it. Yeah. Yeah, no, but we were over time also, so I mean it was like we kind of uh, I didn't watch the clock. I somehow I was like ah. <laughs> Uh, remove, remove. Okay, I think so. Yeah, it's just us now. That's it. We have we have a, a exclusive. Uh, There's no dinner. Yeah, there we're having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we wish. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you very much. I think it's really, uh, it's super interesting. It's like um, I think that someone also talks on this chat about the fear. I think that there is still a lot of um, uh, architects that, uh, and I mean, Fabio is also in a good position to know that at the school, but there is a kind of, um, yeah, fear to discuss these things or to kind of, um, yeah, have a, a more dialogue uh, established between, you know, I don't know, more critical 
uh, you know, fields or aspects or of the discipline and then the kind of super, you know, just technological part somehow feels a bit, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I think also like how it's connected is, is super, super complicated. And I think, I mean, the architects and the software engineers, they kind of can talk well with each other. However, then when you add politics and uh, and and uh, and philosophy into it, it, it really becomes a com complicated um, yeah mix of like uh, how can you how can you actually really uh, for us it's kind of make decisions on like what are the tools you're building, and I think at the moment the moment I think this is also such a conversation helps us a lot because we are kind of there like. We now have kind of all the pieces together to actually really build kind of at the next level, like this kind of urban burning system, and mm -hmm. where we actually, <clears throat> where we really need to, um, we, we are looking for information to actually figure it out, and I think nobody actually mm -hmm. figured it out yet. Eh? Mm -hmm. But I think this. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, no, I, I don't, uh, I mean, I think we could, uh, you know, if you are, if you are interested in this kind of discussions, I mean, perhaps, you know, with Fabio, uh, and maybe with, uh, with a couple of other people, we could, we could set up something which is to say so kind of a more smaller workshop, which really goes into these kind of more, uh, let's say, visionary questions, you know how to how to really uh, unpack the 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 key problems no and what kind of tools we would need to say so align or link together you know in order to have a, a really uh, powerful uh, uh, up, 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 let's say technologies no i mean uh, for instance this uh, um uh, you know could we could we for instance uh, use or how do we so maybe i don't have enough knowledge i would need to also also understand better myself certain aspects of these tools but let's say if we look at uh, at material circuits right so how, how can we use uh, argis to to play around with the with the kind of re the so-called re-territorializing of, of material circuits, right? You know, kind of going from a longer supply chains to more regional, you know, what are the consequences? Could this be done, you know? So this kind of stuff is, we, we are constantly busy in a kind of, uh, more from a more theoretical perspective, we do the kind of ethnographic analysis, mm -hmm. we know how things work, but we are, unable to connect this to some kind of a real, to say so, data uh, uh, um, systems, no? And uh, so this is, uh, this is interesting how, how uh, uh, I think we have uh, interesting insights that are more on the theoretical level, you know, but let's say we are unable to really apply this in the kind of world of data, let's say, no? Mm. So, uh, so I think this, uh, this, uh, for me personally, this would be very, very interesting if we could, uh, you know, if, if, um, um, if let's say such, uh, such, uh, such discussions would be, um, um, you know, uh, opened up uh, to say so initiated in mm -hmm. the future, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, if it's on kind of regional scale, um, I kind of, I can be more kind of like the guy who connects you. Um, yes. But of course, as long as, as, of course, there are many kind of geomatics guys who are kind of where you could connect with and uh, who could kind of visualize such kind of uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if it's on a kind of an urban scale, then uh, yeah, I would be very much interested. For me, what's also very, very interesting are actually really the philosophical questions on like, and and the like, how do we avoid this kind of technology first thing? Like, we do not want to build. Uh, we really do not want to build a software which creates Europalis until we. Uh, this kind it's of very like, appreciated uh, <laughs> <laughs> no 
No, no. Yeah, but uh, there are few people that would love a software that yeah. does Euro Poly. You know, without yes. architect fees, this is fantastic. But but I think I mean Pascal, if you, because I think there is a whole conversation that is now going on at the, and I would say it's something that is, and and I'm gonna use uh, the word, but like let's say. For instance, in gender studies and ecofeminism and all of that sounds like very remote from technology, but I think that actually there is very interesting, um, there are very interesting strands of thoughts that are, and, and they are not connected necessarily with technology and they are usually very critical, but I think if there was a way to actually have a, a real conversation about that, I think that there's a lot of uh, mutual um, benefits from like, I was talking about how this tool can be something that can be used because the power of images is so strong for instance if you are able to use some of the tools that you you do for critical purposes and the same way if you're able in your field to actually draw from this kind of critical views on on new ideas and how to actually move on with the with the with the tool I think that would be super interesting and but, I, but Charlotte I dare there I see a problem because you know the tool is there but the, the tool, tool is the tool evolves, is evolves no sorry the tool evolves constantly yeah but the tool the tool is code i don't know it i mean from inside but i think the tool is uh, extensions plugins but the tool is also a sort of a vision you know a way of, of course. organizing things and so on and uh, the tool is out has uh, a powerful impact on certain that that have that you can critically mm -hmm. them but if you say okay could the tool also serve uh, a critical uh, approach or an, an activist approach then i think mm -hmm. there, there there is a there is a, a, a thinking error in there because the tool should be hacked by activists you know to to do the opposite you know and i think every tool can be hacked you know yeah, but it's I'm not, talking it's not from... just about it's not just about the technology. It's also mm -hmm. maybe just about appropriating it. No, you know? maybe maybe there are so, people out there who who do that already. I don't know about it. I'm not I'm not a hacker personally. I know people who are, and they maybe work with that, but I don't know it myself. I think that there is also one aspect of this that bridge that is related to the legal aspect. I think that, and I don't know, maybe you, Pascal, you can tell me, but I think that you could probably think about uh, a kind of a an inclusion package, you know, for instance, can I plan my city in a way that uh, it's, uh, it's kind of benefiting populations that are actually not the ones that are at the forefront of planning practices, which are usually able people, for instance, just as a kind of, I'm just, I, I just uh, think that also from the point of view, of course, you're right, Fabio, that we can say that people who are doing activism should Put their hands on it and i think some people do but because they are critical of the whole thing they would not necessarily move into these tools i think that there's also potential for the tool to be actually proactively addressing this and i was talking about the default but, but, standards but one of the basic rules you know subversion is appropriating the tools of the adversary and turning into your own you know and i think there there is another very interesting aspect that has been addressed by pascal before do I need how how knowledgeable do I need to be to do this, you know? Or right. the question that comes at the end of every boring discussion about architecture and technologies: Should the architect in the future be programmer? You know, mm -hmm. this is a a a non question. You know, if you are intellectually fit to understand things enough to, I mean, to be able to program is never bad in life, yeah. but enough to be able to understand what a thing does and what it could potentially also do, then you are in the position, for example, that allows you to talk to a programmer, mm -hmm. you know? And then you, are, you suddenly become extremely powerful. And this is different than setting, putting you at, you know, at depending, you know, of the company, asking the companies, like asking Microsoft, could you also do a good thing? Is you know? Ezra like Microsoft? I'm sure. Uh, is oh, no, 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 I'm just saying, I'm just saying, no, 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 not talking about now, but, but you know, it's a powerful player, you know, and they, yeah, pursue, yeah, but, they pursue their agenda. They have, uh, you know, and if you're not naive, we know what this agenda normally is, you know, if you have to survive on the market, you know, mm -hmm. if you're an activist, you pursue a completely different agenda, you know, but you can mm -hmm. make use of the same tools, but you have to dare, you know, mm -hmm. and not expect 
But I mean, I'm not. I think that people do that. I just, uh, I'm just reflecting this, yeah. on on the on on Pascal's presentation and the kind of challenges. And I think that there would be also an interesting mm -hmm. path, which is proactively from the company to actually think about these questions and yeah. and and be yeah. and yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we we. Uh, I think uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting. I I find it uh, I find it really interesting to go in this direction where where we are somehow able to to connect to say so these urban tools with the landscape tools, right? In order to unpack mm. the kind of uh, more uh, questions of sustainability, and I think it goes into the into the larger scales, right? Then and with with the kind of consequences for the design at urban level, but then to say so the, the rules that are emerging have to do somehow with, with some type of uh, 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 perhaps also, um, uh, let's say, ecological performance, right? Because I think that those are, those are more, uh, um, I mean, if you think of this pandemic, right? I mean, the kind of uh, unbelievable, let's say, if, if you, <laughs> you know, the kind of virology, right? The, the logic of, of uh, kind of our organizing society under the conditions of pandemic is kind of incredibly productive if you wanna, wanna reinvent the kind of urban, urban uh, realm around it, right? I mean, the whole, uh, problem of you know the whole kind of idea of density compact city uh, and so on and so on we can kind of re reinvent it immediately right so so um, <clears throat> I uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm personally looking forward so uh, um, uh, let's say I, I hope we can we can we can discuss uh, uh, rather soon. I mean, may, may I? I wanted to ask you: Do you do you work together, or have you worked together in 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 some projects? Two of you. Do you know each other previously? Have you worked together? We. Oui. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, no. I, mean, I, but, uh, I, I, I I I heard of Fabio, but uh, yeah, I have never. Great. Great. No, I'm, I was curious about that. Ones who work on technology, they all know each other. You know. <laughs> no. I no, think I pretty mean, much everybody just, knows just City to... Engine. Yeah, I actually so, worked with City Engine myself when I was uh, in like in um, in an office. We had the City Engine, and I know exactly the default because I remember working with it, and I was like, "Okay, everything is going to look like Paris Hosman." Okay, <laughs> I mean, that was I think I'm it was sorry. 2008, and I was just and they, yeah. they were like, "Hey, there is this great tool." So I started working with it, and uh, mm. I think. Have you tried tweaking mm. a bit the sliders, the hidden sliders? I, I think <laughs> I tried, but I was not. Uh, I was not literate mm. enough, I have to say, and then I, I, I was not. Uh, I didn't spend enough time on it. But I remember that the defaults were Paris Hosman, definitely. <laughs> we we did the work. I mean, it's rule based. I mean, what are you expecting? I don't know if I chose <laughs> French in my nationality, and then it automatically gives you what you want. Yeah. Self-referential. Still, still working on it. And it does this. But maybe uh, it does this through voice recognition. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to scan uh, it to the computer. <laughs> computer knows. <laughs> maybe uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, regarding what what you said, regarding also kind of minorities and stuff. For me, something which would be super interesting is, and I'm not sure if ETH has other kind of data accessibilities than we have, um, but something that was really interesting is we have all this Twitter data or Foursquare data and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're actually really kind of on the one hand, what is the actually useful data you can get out of this? Or like, of course, there is like, you can get good mood or like who's speaking which language and all this kind of stuff. But what it actually means, what are the risks of using this data regarding, for example, or like, like you said, or like there, there will be minorities, um, which, which, which you, which for example, don't use Twitter. But this kind of stuff, like they're, I think this is this is one of these danger zones of like we have these data sets, telco data sets or social media data sets, mm -hmm. and we develop these tools and then they can basically prove everything with these data sets. Whatever they want, or like you can make it somehow you can make it prove it. Um 
And I think this is where we need help. Like this kind of area on like, we have this data, we have this, all this data and like, like how can we avoid that it gets misused? Mm -hmm. um, this is something I'm kind of thinking around a lot and uh, mm -hmm. where well, I how, think- How to uh, tackle the stuff where there is no data because there are a lot of, exactly like the, the non-users and all this, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting and, and important. I mean, we are now working with the uh, at ETH with I'm uh, working with this um, parity and diversity commission, and we're now doing a call, which would be issued tomorrow in, in the next days about for an innovative uh, curriculum. So we're asking for new formats and new contents. Uh, and we invented some. So uh, Fabio, I can tell you the ones that we invented for your institute. Uh, architecture of automation, cleaning robots is not done by robots. <laughs> <laughs> Vernacular complex structures, <laughs> politics of automated architecture, dismantling systems, no automation without labor. Then there's another one about labor. Speak to the unions, automated and non-automated labor in Swiss factories, seminar week. <laughs> uh, who's going to teach this? You. <laughs> you okay. can pick it up. Okay. I no, can pick it up. You cool. can pick it up. It's there. It's like it's about it's how free. Yeah. how you can uh, move on beyond and and addressing these spots that are not provided by the data, for instance, and also talking about users that are not the you know the kind of typical the, the norm. No, thinking beyond the norm. So I, I see that you guys like it already. I can give you a few <laughs> others. <laughs> no, but this is specifically for ITA. Uh, LUS yeah. gets uh, uh, Unable Urban, Zurich for Wheelchairs, Rollator Strollers, Seminar Week. Um, colonial Gardens, Landscape Design and Imperial Making. <laughs> Stuff mm -hmm. like that. You know? So yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, so I think, uh, I think there is Great. definitely potential to, to collaborate. I have to leave, unfortunately. Um, I have to feed my child. Good. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Yes. And, uh, Thank yeah. you. We'll be Thank in touch. Fun. I mean, uh, yeah. do you do you because I uh, I think that there is uh, that there there would be a lot something could come out of this, but uh, we would need to talk mm -hmm. more. I mean, do you do you mm -hmm. would you let us over there in Esri if we came to see what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's always very, very, very <laughs> and, yeah, be, be and be critical and be like, well, what about uh, the Rollator ladies, mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> She's not using Twitter. Perfect. She's not going to tweet. <laughs> I cannot use the sidewalk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it would be very no, nice. No, for sure. Just, uh, just, just drop me in uh, and uh, for sure. Great. Um, Great. Yeah. We'll, we'll make you part of our seminar week, I think. Sounds yeah. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> All right, thank awesome. you very much. I think it was really Thanks. a great way to yeah. end. The Thanks, Fabio. And yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah. Bye, Pascal. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye.